Um, so good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining us. I'm really delighted to welcome this evening's speaker from South Africa. As you all know, I've got a long history with that country. Um, Leon Cluj is a plantsman and garden designer. He grew up on the National Lowfelt Botanical Gardens near Nelspreet in South Africa, and his mother owns and runs a renowned wholesale nursery in that town. Thus, from a very early age, he has nurtured a great affinity for plants. He studied horticulture and landscape design in Israel and is now award-winning landscaper whose customers include the Disney Corporation, the United Nations, various Hollywood celebrities and national governments across the world. For three years now, he has been creating 10 hectares of wild and free-spirited gardens, those are his words, at Sterkopi Farm in the Franschhoek Valley in the Cape Winelands of South Africa. Now, Serge and I were extremely fortunate to spend two weeks a year on this farm for 10 years, from 2010 to 2019, when it was known as Burgundy and Bourgogne, and it was paradise on earth. Um, a slightly different regime was in place. We had our little cottage and it was surrounded with a very green lawn and a lovely formal head rose about, um, iceberg. And the lady gardening squad came and they deadheaded the, the roses in continuation to make sure that they were always in flower. So it was water intensive, labor intensive. Now this evening, we're gonna hear from Leon about the new owner's vision and the, the new garden that his got creativity and design are helping manifest. Thank you so much, Leon, for being with us. If you would like to be un unmute yourself now and share your screen, there you go. Okay. Say, share screen. Almost there. There we go. Is that all good? Yep. Oh, I, perfect. I can see, and I'm just going to change the view now. My yes. speaker. Okay, thank you. Thank you for having me. And um, yeah, it's, um, it's quite an honor to speak to all of these avant gardeners from all the Mediterranean climates around the earth. And um, we have one here too in Africa, right on the southern tip, which is the Western Cape. Well, the southern tip of the Western Cape. And we are, unlike any other part in Africa, we are winter rainfall and summer dry. And so this also gives, you know, almost a different kind of gardening here in South Africa, uh, which is... Um, well, a diff how can I say? The northern parts of South Africa is a little bit different. It's bush felt, it's very African, thorn trees, grasslands, and very green. The southern tip of Africa is full of flowers. And we are very rich in flowers, which is so nice. So just to put it in perspective, Table Mountain, which is a little mountain, well, it's not that little, in the center of Cape Town, has more plant species than the whole of UK. And that is how rich we are in our biodiversity. Now in Franschhoek, where I live, it was, I was asked by the owners who are from Holland and they came to South Africa for a wedding and she decided not to leave. And she bought this farm that was for sale in the heart of Franschhoek. It's a beautiful farm right in the valley, quite a historic little farm. And she got hold of me to chat to me about what she envisaged for the farm. It was very dilapidated. Everything was falling apart already. The own previous owners were not investing in the farm anymore as there's been a, a few um, problems on their side. And the vision that the owner has for this farm completely changed as well. It's not going to be a wine farm, although there are some vineyards being replanted now. It's more focused on a spiritual healing aspect. But the spiritual healing and plants are together hand in hand. So the brief that I got for the farm from the owner was, we want 
a wild, free-spirited garden, nothing constrained and contrived. Uh, we want it to be a farm garden. We want the plants that's in the areas of the different gardens to be still utilized in the either kitchens uh, as aesthetics in the, in the buildings or as cosmetics. So every part of the garden needs to be used in some way. And then it's also, it's as if the farm, farmer went away and on holiday and came back a few weeks too late. And it looks like the farm has just started to overgrow. Now, this is the Franju Valley. So we are very rich in, in wine. So everything, not everything alcohol based, we also have fruits here. But it's a very beautiful place. It's very hot in summer. It's 40 degrees still two weeks ago. But in winter, it's very wet. And we have snow on the mountains, which is a little bit strange for people to grasp being in Africa. When I started the farm, I was invited by the owners to come to the farm and have a look and live the space for a week and see how it feels. And then also start the design process, which takes a while. And so I came to the farm. There was nobody here. It was just me. The owner's still overseas. And then whilst I was on the farm, the COVID pandemic hit and lockdown hit South Africa as well. And I was forced to be on the farm for months and months and months longer than I thought it would be. So in that time, it was a bit of a stressful time for everybody. But in the hindsight, it was quite... It was quite a blessing in disguise being caught up on this little farm and seeing literally the seasons change and then let my mind go in what we're going to do. Not only that, and I'll get to that a little bit later, but we also started a nursery. Now, this is a part of the buildings of the old farm, the old house where the owner lived. Now, I'm going to show you some of the older parts and then how we went about in creating the new spaces that is now. Otherwise, the talk will be very long. So you can see a lot of depletion in, in the buildings. It's not looking great here. We were starting to redo some areas. This little hook of Franschhoek is called Olifant's Hook. It's a little part of Franschhoek. And it's one of South Africa's highest rainfall areas in the rainy season. In the dry season, it's one of the driest. And this is also where they catch the water for Cape Town to, to feed the city. Now, Olifantsuk was also a wetland. So it's very dry, but right underneath, and you'll see a slide of that, it's clay soil, very dense clay. And that clay is used to make pottery. So that is the beauty of the clay and the density of it. So when it rains, the water don't go anywhere. It just lies there. So my plant pattern had to be in such a way with drainage and soil works to be able to withstand intense heat and dry and wind and also cold and wet. So this is the extent of the gardens when I received it at that point. So I started to prune all the olives that were on the farm. There were quite a bit, lots of lawn. There were, now this was a little bit after the previous owners left. So it was a little bit neglected even more so. And some roses and you know, just a little bit of a sad space at that time. And then areas looking like that. So you can see our soil. This was the front end of the main building after we've took out all Angela's beautiful iceberg roses. And then this is the designs that we work. So with all my garden designs, I work by hand. That's how I like doing it. We paint all our pictures and that forces us to concentrate on each little area of the garden and we live the sketch and live the space. Sometimes when you do a computer thing, copy and paste seems very easy. Everything we draw out for the garden, each little aspect of this is almost 10 hectares as garden. So it was a lot of sketching during those months that we planned. And this is the nursery that we started. So I was in the gardens. I do the Chelsea Flower Show for South Africa at Chelsea every year. So I always buy lots and lots of seeds and I bring it back. So I have a seed library full of it. And this is a place where I thought a lot of the seed might be quite handy. 
And so we started the process. So 95% of the plants that we used in this garden, we grew ourselves. We didn't buy in, except some fruit trees and some bigger trees. There's a nursery starting to evolve. And remember, this is still lockdown. We weren't allowed to even go to the shop to, to, to buy some supplies for the nursery. And there's the nursery starting to take shape. And we had an old tractor that broke down every second day, but it still got our planties all the way to the garden when we started to build. So this is the back of the main building, which all the guests were at that time. And then the pool that was there. Um, not so inviting, but after we worked with it, it looks like that at the moment. So we brought in a lot of olive trees from the farm, from the top that was neglected. We pruned them back, planted them in. We don't have that much lawn anymore because we just don't have the water for that in, in the summer. But we brought in lots of wild grasses, mostly South African grasses, although we do have some other in between. The soft, airy feel, we play with the wind, which we have a lot in, in um, Franschuk and soft greens with different colors popping up throughout. And this is a view from the table setting, which is um, from here towards that pool. Now, this is a horror scene because if you go to a garden and you see one of these things, you just want to run away. The previous owners had this wonderful plastic lawn and it was one of the first things that they had to get rid of. It's so bad for the soil. And everything on this farm was also sprayed. All the weeds were constantly sprayed. All the fruit trees were constantly sprayed. So the soil was so bad that even if we planted something, it would immediately go yellow. So we had to sit back, relax, and do ground preparation, which took us probably close to a year to achieve. And putting back organics and putting sowing things into the soil to start and get life back into that soil, which was completely depleted and looked like that. After that, this is now for the plum orchard and herb garden. We started to set out this space and this is how it looks like now. So this is the entrance to these gardens. So we have this old little gate. There were these tiny little pillars, but we make our own gates with all the old wood that were there from the old buildings, from the window frames. All the stone work that we did in the gardens is stone that we dug out of the old gardens and then repurposed. So the plum orchard is also the herb garden. It's a beautiful mix where we espalier all the plum trees. And each room of plum trees is a different type of plum so that they would get ripe and flower before the others. So we have a two-month period of harvesting plums. I do espalier them so we get enough sun into our herb garden. So that our herbs and companion planting, because we don't spray on the farm, works well. And this year was the first year that we had a harvest and we hardly had any worms or little insects in our plums. Uh, I used a lot of bergamot, um, bee balm in my gardens, uh, especially with the plums, they flower at the same time so that I can get a lot of insects in. Another thing that we don't have in South Africa is we don't have aliums, you know, the um, the garlic onion family and I'm always so jealous to look at the Europeans or the Americans having all these aliens in their gardens and we can't have anything so my alternative for that is I use garlic leeks leeks and I use it a lot in my gardens and we get all kinds of colors of leeks and that's also used in the kitchens not only leeks we use um, artichokes we use mints, we use carrots, everything in the gardens to also aesthetically look nice, but also have a purpose. This is inside the, the um, plum orchard. So all the plums are espalier, the rooms, and it's a full garden. We don't have empty soil at all. Everything is covered. And it's covered, like I mentioned before, companion planting. It's a chain reaction. The one helps the other, helps the other, helps the other. And so it's a little biome starting in our gardens. 
The plum, which is also divided into three main areas. One is the origanum area, with we have all the different types of origanum and flavors that work with it for the kitchens. The other one's the mint area where we have the whole mint family everything that's in that family whole big range of mints and the other one is time a time room so there were a few mulberries in the garden but the mulberries also these weeping mulberries at the entrance and exit of the garden almost gives me that curtain fall you know when the stage opens on at the theater it feels like those mulberries does that for me too our pathways are usually mostly either stone, gravel, laterite, or in this case here, peach and apricot pips that we crush. And gives a beautiful sound when you walk over it. And also breeze air and let water through. We don't use any cover underneath our gravels or anything to block out weeds. Weeds, in some areas we do encourage. The weeds come up. They are nurse plants to the seed that we are sowing. So because it's so hot here, new seedlings burn. So when the weeds are higher, we have our seed coming up. When they are almost teenager, or maybe just before teenager, we pull out the weeds and so our little seeds are hard enough to survive and now flourish into adulthood. This is more areas of our herb and plum orchard. Now, if you look to the picture on the left on my side, you'll see that in that lawn area there, there's a little island, a little round circle. Now, that little round circle is the filter that I clean all my water off. So all our water is naturally cleaned, and that filter is for the pool, the natural pool or one of the eco pools. So this was just the concept sketch at the beginning, and this is how the area looked like before, if this would work. No, no. Hmm. Hold on. I'm going to go out. It doesn't seem to want to go forward. Yeah. Hmm. Technical difficulties. <laughs> So why doesn't it want to click forward? Oh God, hold on. You're in PowerPoint? Yes, you're in your yeah, uh, It doesn't want to escape now. Mm. What a shame, it's going very well. Okay, what am I gonna do? Oh, there we go, something happening. <laughs> there we go. It went forward. It's a brand new iPad. You can just see. I should have gone for the Huawei. Anyway, so this is the pool that was before. This is not my pool. So we had a big barbecue there and the lawns that was everywhere and this pool. So I wanted to demolish that and create this eco pond, which will be the old manor building, which is now converted into a spa. So people after the spa, can involve themselves and like relish themselves into an eco pool with no chemicals whatsoever. So starting out, and here I come back to that clay section. You can see how clay our soil is. So it is, you know, a pottery would pay big money for that. So we just we took out the ugly little pool and the barbecue area and started to work in getting our shape for our new pool, which is our eco pool. This is starting to be built and every every day we are building and trying to get the bricks down the more it rained that winter so every morning we had to put in a pump and pump out all the water so this took us much longer than we thought it would but from that to what it is now so this is the eco pool at the moment so after a beautiful relaxing day at the spa you just rinse off in the spa and then you go into this natural pool which is completely cleaned by plants so the water siphers out on the sides is pushed to the filter at the top and then cobbles down all the way back into this round pool there's tiny little fish in because we do have mosquitoes we don't want any more so they eat out all the little larvae and now at the moment we put in some 
some nice chairs around it. Now, tennis court. I'm not a big sportsman, so it doesn't bother me taking out all the sporty stuff. But a tennis court's always hard, it's ugly, it always cracks, it's just never nice. If you want to play tennis, go to a tennis club. Here, this was one of the first things that I took away and softened it and made it into a usable space that we also use in the cosmetics part of the farm into a sunken lavender garden. Now you enter this garden, you walk down into the garden and you're emerged by the lavender and the planting around you. And that's also where they do early morning yoga or at night they have dinners on that lawn. It's a natural planting. So in a sense that, yes, you have the big areas of only lavender, which is lavender doula intermedia. So we do harvest that to make oil. But slowly but surely, it thins out into the landscape where it's more towards the white and green um, flowers. This is still very young. This garden is only about a year old. And then when you have to harvest all the flowers to be taken in to make oil, it still needs to look nice. So this is how it looks like after a harvest of a heavy prune. And that's where we have some sessions also in the garden. Now, there was a big dam on the farm. Well, there's actually quite a few dams. But this one was silted up to the brim, so it didn't hold much water. So we had to completely clean the dam and hollow it out, create a proper island with decent soil, build a bridge, plant new plants under the water. So if we can have that almost eco pool system so that it can clean our water and create this little island where we can also have meditation sessions for certain clients. This was when we started to build a bridge over it. It took us a long time <laughs> to get this out. And that's how it looks like now. So it's a little white island, lots of little white flowers, almost meadow-like. All very natural. We do, it's not contrived. And then the walk towards the deck that's right in the middle is all planted with chamomile. So that you have that scent of... Oh, so that's just a beautiful scent, scent of relaxation, I would say, arriving at the round deck on the island where you do the therapy sessions. This was the old historic homestead on the farm. It was built in 17-something, and um, it's, it's a beautiful building. That's, that's where I stayed uh, whilst being on lockdown. Um. I kept to the theme of the old history of the building in, in a slight sense that I did keep a bit of a formal walk towards the main door. Formal walk, but still a, a fairly informal planting in the lines. This is our little plants out of the nursery. Very proud. I know the, the pots and things are part of every size and color you can think of. We had to scramble to get things, but our planting started to work. Now my computer is again slow. Don't worry, just be patient. It'll okay. <laughs> it'll come. We'll, we'll, we'll wait. So, we'll this is in the middle of, of winter there. So it is quite cold. It is wet and um, extremely windy. Um, the Cape is known for its storms all throughout the winter season. So it's not easy to, to get the plants to a decent height. They get cut by Mother Nature. Okay, I'm trying to get my computer to go forward. Oh, I don't know why it's stuck. I go one back, go one back. No, nothing. I don't want to, don't want to do anything. Oh, it's a shame. There. Okay, there, there we go. go. There you go. 
Okay, so that is how it looks like now. Let me just see. Okay, hold on. Now it's almost skipped everything. There we go. So this is the planting that leads down the main manor house down towards the bottom of the farm. So it's a soft planting with nigellas and oleas and amis and lichnus and some grasses. Very soft and we can walk past and it's almost like they cheer you back to your house. They're almost eye level to you. And it's also where we cut a lot of flowers for inside the retreat. Now, this is where the garden merges with the indigenous garden. So I do have a local indigenous garden. At the top, you'll see where before the big tree, there's all those row of yellow flowers, the wakandorfias, and that's where our indigenous garden starts. So we are not purists in the sense of it only has to be indigenous or exotic, but we do have a, a good mix of it. And I, this is where the exotic starts to merge with the indigenous in a sense that you don't notice it. And we have lots of little animals on the farm because we now make our own compost. Everything that we cut from the kitchens and uh, lawns and vines, we mulch. And every morning we collect all the dung of the horses, the donkeys, the, the cows, everything, the chickens here. Um, and it's put into our um, compost heaps. So this is another area where the indigenous garden is now. This is how it looked like then with the little dam in the corner. And we moved it and shaped it into these undulating uh, mounds so that you don't see the whole garden space from one point. Kind of you have to go and explore the gardens to be able to appreciate and see everything. And this is the indigenous meadow, all local grasses. It's called Kongoni grass, beautiful thing. And that's the dam at the moment with all our local planting around it. Now, this local planting is also, we, we focused on plants with interesting scents, uh, interesting flavors to it, so that the chefs in the kitchen can use some of our local things and bring it into the kitchens to create either drinks or foods or flavorings to whatever they use. So it's kind of, in a sense, indigenous herb garden. This is also in the garden, so all the, our local little plants. And our pathway is still all natural, no havers. Kongoni grass is some of our local scabiosa, wakandorfias, and the view to Mount Rochelle, which is the big mountain surrounding the farm. There's some derama too. I'm so jealous. You, also, you guys have all those wonderful hybrids of deramas. We don't get them. And this is a very special one. I bet you don't know this one. This is, you know, red opocus. So this is one of the world's biggest red opocus, if not the biggest. This is um, Knophophia multiflorus, and it comes from the northern parts of South Africa. Now you have those foxtail lilies that they always use in Chelsea and all those beautiful gardens, and we can't grow them. They just don't want to do well here. So this is our alternative. This big red hot poker that gets to two two and a half meters high with this densely densely shaped orange flowers and that's also in the meadow around the gardens and it's a little bit of a bird's eye view of that space so the pond the duck pond indigenous garden going to the indigenous meadow which is all those kidney shapes in between the lawn you'll see the little circle for the the um eco pond cleaner there's the little bowls port and then this was the first garden we did when we arrived. And this was a little horse paddock. And now it's our chakra garden. The garden's divided into eight sections. And it's the eight chakras. So we start with the base chakra all the way through the chakra just above your head, which is white in color. And the base chakra has more of a red tint to it. And each one flows into another one slowly but surely. And it has that color intensity to it too as well. There you can see it from the top. It's divided into this wave. Those straight little lines on the bottom, that is the plum orchard that we spoke about earlier. So chakra gardens, all of those wavy turns that you see on your screen, and that's made out of stone. So dry stack stone that we got out of the garden. And then we made a pond at the top, pond at the bottom, and then a stream connecting the two, which is the spine. That's where we started to, to build the, 
the walls. And that's how it looks like now. So it is a very soft meadow garden that changes. The garden has personality. It never looks the same month by month. It's always different plants, different flowers appearing and disappearing. And that's why we always plant in quite a few different layers so that we always have different points of interest in the garden. This is one of the little meadows when the green gladiolus pop through. Different times of the year have the different effects of the garden. So in early spring, just end of winter on the left-hand side, the garden has lots and lots of color. On the right-hand side, it's just after the colors faded out, it becomes a bit more green. So when clients come back for a second or a third time, and it's different times of the year, the garden has a completely different feel and look to it and height. And I want you to emerge yourself in our garden and in our grasses. You must feel like you're alone in the grass, and that's actually somebody in the garden. That's the base chakra. This is a video uh, entry point from where you walk in. And then again in different times. So this is late spring. This is the yellow flower starting to pop up when uh, in the yellow part of the chakra, which is center-based. And again, our pathways are very subtle. You don't know where you're walking. You're walking through this natural landscape, just exploring and appreciating all the flowers and diversity that we put into our gardens. This is when we cut down the gardens. So once a year, just before the grasses and most of our plants start shooting, as with you up there, we cut them down and soon we get the effect. And that is the chakra meadow throughout the season. And when when we cut all our gardens, we don't throw it away, I either go to the compost heap, but a lot of it we keep in a room where we dry all our grasses and our dried flowers and things and that we use for installations in the retreat itself. And then every now and then we also do play. So when it's a snowy day in Franschuk, it's always fun. Those were the three trees or the three plants that I really loved. It was only three plants I really liked on the farm, which we kept. And it's those beautiful plane trees and that willow over there. It's now our wishing trees. This is another little part of the garden, which looked like this just over a year ago. And builders still building, you know, landscape and builders never, never see eye to eye landscapers see all the little soft little delicate things and builders only see pipes and digger loaders and that's how it looked like very 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 rough but now just about a year later it is a very peaceful space lots of fine textures colors of blues purples pinks and whites mixed with a range of greens into this soft space. Again, the pathways, a mix of chamomile and stone or laterite. All the cottages also have a sense of being on a farm. So each one has a little courtyard built for it. And they would have different um, vegetables in it. This would be a, a salad garden. Then we'd have a strawberry patch or we would have peas and it changes constantly. You must feel like you're in your own little garden, your own space. This is one of the rooms over there with a little soft meadow planted around it. Now, this was a chicken coop that we were handed when we took over the farm. Clearly not, a, not good enough for my little chickies. And this is what we built for them. So beautiful, proper thatch roof chicken coop in the vegetable garden. And this vegetable garden works really hard. So we harvest twice a day here for the hotel and the kitchens and also for all the animals on the farm. This is the inside of the chicky coop. We have ducks there too because we have some wild cats here and they tend to love ducks. So they're hiding over there. Again, there's some of the aliens which I just love planting, which I'm trying. Some of our 
planting pallets in the gardens. And we have rich bird life here too. So we do want to cater for them, not only through nectar and insects, but also grasses to either line their nests or feed them in winter time. Now, our vegetable garden that you can see in the background there is surrounded by indigenous planting as well, Cape Fainbull's planting. And this is to attract insects to the vegetable garden, but also this is where we host our bees. So our beehives are hosted all around our vegetable gardens, hidden in between our Fainbull's. One of my favorite or layers which pops up. And that's what we also do. We don't really cut down everything immediately. We let it seed, we harvest seed and keep it in our library for what we need. A lot of it we let fall and whatever comes up, we decide whether they stay or not or thin them out and the rest go to composting. Oops. Some of our planting pallets. So this was an area that was also converted into vegetable gardens. This is from the drone from the air where we started to make our lines and then started to build all our little walls into creating this vegetable garden, which the kitchen completely uses every day. So it's from garden to plate, making our own little screens all kinds of invasive trees and also the vines that we prune. More structures and starting to get to a shape. So this in front of Zavata Blomiki Aponegiton, which is a vegetable in the water that we have in the Capes, very famous in the Capes, one of the most delicious stews that you can make out of it. And it has a beautiful scent too. I think they make perfume out of it as well. And a little bit later, so this is how it's looking now. So our vegetables also, our vegetables, fruit, um, herbs, everything is mixed together in this garden setting. Not everybody on its own little patch, but all mixed healthily together. This is the latest part of the vegetable garden, which is still maturing, still kind of teenage. We have a little olive grove going down to the vegetable garden. And this is our lemon orchard, actually. With It's got the poles in between the lemons where we put big tables where people can have a beautiful dinner at night. And it's also interplanted with a lot of um, different plantings like rosemary or echinacea. This is our washing bay. So it's a big stone that was on the farm that we hollowed out, put in a tap. And this is where we wash all our vegetables in the vegetable garden. Yeah, and in front here, yeah, this is um, actually very interesting. I don't know if you use it over there, but this is African foxglove. So it comes from the Kruger Park right in the north, Gauteng, Pumalanga. And we use it in the vegetable garden. Not only is it pretty, but it's alternative to sesame seed. And this is the watergrass pond. And how the garden, vegetable garden looks like now. So it's really rich and in growth with lots and lots and lots of different goodies to eat. So everything in this garden is used in the kitchens. And the garden surrounded by our indigenous plants and the plants here in the front is all heavily scented to, to flavor some of the foods. This is the heart of the farm, this big rose quartz, which we got from Namibia and all the energy flows from her. And then we make our own baskets with the vines that we cut and prune. That's just the walk to the chicken coop. And our little piggies. And in the indigenous garden, all, all our grasses, melanus that you also used um, all over the world, which is local grass, it has lots of little details of tiny little plants local to here. So it's a botanical journey walking through the gardens, not only indigenous, but also exotic. It's one of our beehives. And a walk in the, in the vegetable garden with the tagitis lemony. 
And this is the last part I'm going to chat about. And this is the butterfly garden. So this is where it was just palms and some tree ferns, heavily overgrown and matted. So it took us a long time to prep this area. It's quite a big area. And it now looks like this. So put in beautiful olive trees, a nice soft planting, laterite as pathways, lots of textures, so from very fine to um, more bold. But this is where the sun sets every day. So walking in this garden to where the sun has its last say, the whole garden starts to glow. And that is why I have mostly wheat colored and lots of white in this garden. So to accentuate that glow during golden hour. One or two of the other interesting edible plants that we plant in our gardens. There's lots of artichokes, lots of carrots, lots of leeks. Again, still ponds. Um, all of our ponds are not over accentuated. We don't have fancy um, trapeze artists spewing water out of it. It is just plain and simple and reflecting the plants and the sky. And this is our textures too in the butterfly garden. Saying butterfly also attracting lots of butterflies and insects. Very water wise. Um, so we only irrigate twice a week. In 40 degrees, that's saying something. Just a quick overview of a part of the garden that we looked at now. So you can see at the bottom of the screen, it's a lower productive garden. And then to the left of the screen is upper productive. So it's the vegetable garden, which is still very new. Then the big pond with the indigenous garden around it. Um, to the right is the old manor house, the perennial garden. The butterfly garden is next to that, but we can't see that on the photo. And then right at the top, you'll see chakra garden right at the top. And then below it, the plum orchard. And then the magnolia lawn and the eco pool. Yeah, and this is me and Tristan, my assistant, and it's just me and him and five guys, and we built this garden over the course of this almost three years now, us, and that's it. Wow, that's a major achievement unbelievable amount of growth in such a short time um, yeah it, la it, last it, it, last yeah. month we were in the south of france and we saw um, a, a slightly a much uh, things were deliberately kept being slow and low growing because they are you know designed that way but they there we saw less abundance i i, I don't know it's just phenomenal the amount that is just arrived in this short time Crazy. yeah it did go it did go very it did go quick in a sense for me maybe not so much because i live it every day just about hmm. but um it's only been about three years now since the inception of me moving into that little house supposedly for a week and um and yeah it changed dramatically and it's um becoming coming a beautiful space and this was phase one we are now busy with phase two which is an extension to the north where we have our walks of contemplation and big dams and um, yurts and then we have phase three which is going up Staracopi up the mountain where the old vineyards were and that will be more uh, Fainbos Protea gardens with some other additions as well so we still have a couple of years left in this specific garden Phenomenal. So I saw there were questions in the chat. Um, so I don't know if you can read about them. what my what computer I use, right? Pardon? About what computer I use. <laughs> Sorry. No, don't worry. That we uh, the, the images are just they're fabulous. So are you taking your own photographs as well? Yeah, we take our own photos. Yes, it's okay, just so on. So there were some questions there. Um, Leon, can you see the chat underneath? Do you want yeah. to read those yourself and respond? Or does uh, Yvonne want to possibly read out? Or... Oh, you, you can read our chat. You can just go. Okay. Yeah. 
So the but chat. Just. I must have got from the top. Okay, or? so yes. Okay, how much rainfall on average do you get in a year? Ooh, I would say it's about, you know, in winter it can rain a lot, um, but only for a short period of time. So we can get over a thousand moles, but then it stops. And a lot of that rain, as you can see, it's clay soil. It just washes away and goes into the river. We, we don't see a lot of it staying in our soil we do we do i wish it was so we get a lot of rain in winter time but in summer almost nothing um yeah, yes you can use a lot of them in california most definitely i did source a few plants from california as well really special um so our pergolas and vegetable garden we all we make it from invasive trees that we have here some blue gums some pines we cut them down, reuse them, either mulch them or make pergolas. And the the where we make shapes out of it, and um, what's the English word? Trellises and things that we use vines that we prune. Every year we have to prune a bit of wine, vines that we have. And when the flowers are finished flowering, I assume you cut them down. Do you cut the wavy grasses at the same time? No, I don't. So I cut my flowers um, when the seeds are ready and I need to harvest the seeds and they start to break because our wind is strong. But I don't wanna, I love the skeletons of grasses and some of the flowers too. It gives you a winter wonderland that is different to anything else. And that is also attracting a lot of birds to the garden during those that off time where there's hardly any other grass seeds for them to eat. So I give my, I keep my grasses, they blow in the wind and they flap it around. And then just when that green starts to form at the bottom, it's still almost dormant standing still, then I cut them down and I go vicious. And for about three weeks, as those slides I showed you, we have, we have it very short, but after three weeks, the garden's out again. So it goes very, very quickly. The olive trees were on the farm. We had a very um, a neglected olive field which was a little bit sick so we needed to treat them a bit and cut them down and but we moved about 100 olive trees throughout the garden um we only lost four and all the rest did very very well so i'm very happy about that and the four that we lost was the painters cleaning the paint buckets on our trees so they no, are not really their fault um so we are only five gardeners that maintain the whole garden. So it's me, Tristan, which we are going to other gardens as we do as well. And I have five permanent guys on this, going to 10 hectares of garden. Um, thank you, thank you. <laughs> okay, so. Is there anything else? Um, I, I can see Ma Mi Mirelle Furi has her hand raised. So okay. perhaps if you'd like to unmute Mirel, Mireille, not sure oh, how to say that. Hiya. Hi. Hi. Um, hi, Leon. Amazing. Hello. Um I just wanted to ask about the clay. I'm currently working in a chateau where we are struggling with clay. Mm. And I'm wanting to know how you were able to firstly, how did you work the first year to prepare? And then following years. How quickly did you see um, difference in the, in the clay, or did you simply it's choose? Still plants could... <laughs> it's still a process. It's yeah, so it's still it's it's still a process happening. So what we did in the beginning is because it was so dense, uh, we had to obviously we we broke it up a little bit, but then trying to get organic matter in, also a little bit of bigger pieces, so it's not too fine and it compacts again, but then also so in between and get plants to grow in it and start to break up that soil but it's not going to take one or two seasons i think this farm still has a 10-year pr um, process that will still need to happen for that soil to be to to get better but lots of organic matter and then lots of planting even if the planting in the beginning doesn't look that healthy it's still a start and use some of you know plants that put nitrogen back in and break up the soil and uh, it's too expensive for us to bring in when we don't want to bring in other soil either. So we also don't want to buy compost because it's a big farm. 
So we're still in the process where ever we get compost that's ready, some of our mulch, it starts to have that nice organic scent to it, we work it into the soil. And that is a big reason why we got the animals in, not only to be cuddly, but the chickens, the horses, the cows, the ducks, everything, every day, it's a ritual. It goes to the compost heap and we put it back into the soil. No easy way out of it, unfortunately. <laughs> but also, when you do the gardening, it's also clever planting. So planting species that can handle a bit of water logging in your rainy season and don't suffocate. So it's not, yeah, look at the area that you're in and use plants that can utilize that soil. Thank you. Which one now? Oh, I'm muted. Sorry, Nicholas Stadden. Hi. Hi, Nicholas. Hey, uh, good morning, everyone. Or good, good evening, depending on where you are in the world. L Leon, that was the cat's meow. That was just terrific. Um, I, I'm interested to know who, who are your mentors? Who do you who do you follow to create such a terrific garden? Boy. Um, look, I there's a few landscape designers which I've had the pleasure, luckily, of working with that definitely have been mentors. But if I have to be truly honest. It's not any designers. So my gardens are inspired by nature, meaning that I grew up, like was mentioned before, in the botanical gardens. So I hiked the mountains with uh, bot botanical people looking for different plants all the time. So I'm bombarded, because I want to, with all of these different textures and flavors of plants in the mountains. And that is what gives me my inspiration of placing textures. Um, uh, against one another so if I have to look at designers that have the same philosophy than me I would say definitely a good friend of mine James Basson um, is one of them um, yeah and then a few designers here but but um, no no Instagram inspiration, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, well, that, <laughs> Going to that's... nature and finding those beautiful things, inspirational photos, and trying to, to work with what she gives uh, me to work with, or trying to copy what she does, although how difficult it might be. Yeah. And it's well, a couple of plants. That's pretty much the ethos of, of the society. And it's it's one of the first lessons that you know we, we recommend that people go out and look around them. Yeah. Um, before imposing design ideas. Exactly. And, and I, I have a, a TV show here in South Africa where, we, where I'm a judge on a flower arranging competition. And it's so obvious when people come in on the show and you know the, the evening or maybe the week before and they were just on Pinterest nonstop looking at ideas. And it's not about that. Yeah. It's about uh, originality. And it's about going grassroots and see how things grow and look together and, and, and using that. Yeah, attention yeah. To, to, de to, to, to that sort of detail, which you yeah. were obviously helped with because of your, of growing Absolutely. up in, in this extreme sort of intense botanic world. Yeah. Um, yeah. We have a, call, we have a, a question from Sha Sean O'Hara in California. Hi, Sean. Hey, Leon, I, <clears throat> I have to say that um, you're, you're very inspiring to me over Instagram and other social media. I love how enthusiastic you get and how you Ooh, talk about you. things that all the little details and the, the feelings and the textures. I mean, for me, that's what it's all about. It's Thank great. You. Um, you were you talk about using a lot of indigenous um, South African plants. Are there some in particular that tolerate your heavy wet in winter and dry in summer? So you know, quite a, it depends on the little area, but rockendorphias work really well. Yeah. yeah. Um, look, South Africa or the Cape, where I am now, is the home of the Arum lily. <laughs> how common that might be there over there it is it is its home here 
we have a, a um, an arrange of erica species that work really well from a dry area to right into the water into the sedge and then talking about sedges all the rest yos are local to this area and they can take an immense amount of dry um, spells but just as wet as well and uh, melianthus is something that you guys use up there a lot yeah, yeah. Uh, one of our locals and we have a lot of different species and pelagoniums not the pelagonium in disneyland that goes over the hanging baskets all of these ones with the most tiny like interesting little flowers and you can get pelagoniums to grow right into the water to right on the baking rocks so and salvia, sages. We have so many salvias here, species that can work well too. We are a little bit of a, I am spoiled with plants over here when it comes to local things. I must be honest. <laughs> you so, certainly are. We have, we have something for everything. But, but as I mentioned before, yes, I'm not a purist. I do appreciate the plants set from California as well. Um, like your Rebecca's and some of your sages, for instance. Um, which is just as wonderful. And I try to use some of that here as well. And Great. It's, it's interesting to me that um, there are so many plants that are adapted to being basically underwater yes. in the winter time, but then bone dry in the summer. And most people don't think the two could could work yeah, together and, at all but, so it's, what, what makes it more difficult is remember this is a, a retreat and then it's quite a a lani one so the the gardens also needs to be presentable and and beautiful in the sense during the time when those plants are now sleeping so i need to bring in other plants in between them subplanting so that i have the other plants showcasing themselves while the others uh, in the wet season or sleeping, but not killing the ones that are sleeping at the same time. So it's a very yeah. delicate balance of, of planting. Yeah. yeah, definitely. Okay, so Nan, Nan Stern, Sternen has asked on the chat, where can Californian people buy? Is it what uh, South African plants? Is that what you want to know, Nan? Is it seeds maybe? If it's plants, okay. it's I'm not reading the chat. So, no, the, well, if it's specific, seeds, specifically, I was asking about Wachendorfia. Oh, oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah. So, we have a company in South Africa called Silver Hill Seeds, and they yes. have, and yes, you can just you know, order through them. Yeah. Okay. That's good. Thank you. Pleasure. Carol Bornstein has her hand up. Thank you. Um, first, thank you so much for this uh, amazing presentation. Very inspiring. I have two questions. Um, one, even though the garden is very young, maybe because hmm. it's very young, are you finding yourself um, doing some editing of the plant compositions to sort of keep certain things in balance? Are you letting it kind of do its own thing and um, mature um, yeah. with a very light touch? That's one, yeah. and the and the second has to do with a comment you just had about the fact that it's a retreat and um, wanting the gardens to look, you know, beautiful when people are there. Have you um, dedicated any particular garden to um, go through the seasons and go dormant without trying to incorporate other plants that will keep it green so and colorful, is, or or let it go brown, silver? Yeah bronze, whatever the colors may yeah. be. See, I like so those, those are my two questions. Yeah, nice. <laughs> so I love the season. So this garden is all about seasons. It's not even the seasons. It's just it's seasons within seasons for me. So what's fabulous about South Africa and the Western Cape here is that when we, our flowers are at its most beautiful and all the proteas and ericas and our local things, are in full flower, that's when all the rest are sleeping. It's in right in the middle of winter going into spring. So winter time is really beautiful here, even if we have snow, which is very unique throughout the world, I would say. There's not many places that have the same uh, spectacle. And that makes it a little bit easier in a sense that our local plants are really pretty at that time. And uh, plants from other parts of the world are a little bit more off. But saying that too, I, 
I love like the, the like the chakra garden or butterfly garden, the last one that I showed you. That is completely seasonal, but there are always plants that take the opportunity to send out flowers or beautiful, you know, beautiful fluorescence throughout a dry time where other plants are not there in sleeping because there's always an insect looking for some nourishment. And we have it here too. During the dry time, we would have chinkering cheese or something starting to flower. And you use those plants in between the others that take that opportunity to flower when others are not flowering and use them in your garden. But yeah, you know, it's 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 a little bit of editing too in the garden, I would I would say, because there are one or two plants that do get a bit big and I don't want to lose them. So I might move one or two plants away from them because I want the garden in the beginning to be presentable, but how can I say not lose it? This is South Africa, so we lost electricity at the moment. Welcome. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> I'm going to, yes. So we have this how many times a day? But in any case, so there is slight editing, but my gardens are also there to be to be left and the seasons to be enjoyed. And if there's something that I feel like needs to be changed a little bit, I would do that, but we don't do that a lot. No. Thank you. I hope I answered your question. Yes. Thank and you. I look yeah. ghostly now in my photo. Yes, you do. <laughs> but how how have you got how have you got Wi-Fi if if there is no power? Have there you... is a battery. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Well, it only lasts a few uh, like ten minutes. Exactly. So mm. let's have a quick question from Rick, and we'll and we'll finish there. Hi, Rick. Nice Hi. To you. Uh, Hi. Fantastic presentation. Thank you very much. Um, pleasure. Greetings from Southern California. Um, you know, about uh, 25 kilometers northwest of, uh, of where the farm is that you have just uh, described in beautiful detail, uh, there's a wine estate named, and I'll probably mispronounce it, Babylon Storen. And yes. uh, I'm just curious as to whether you have uh across paths with uh Ernst, Ernst van Jarsveld uh who has been involved for the past few years developing the gardens at that wine estate yeah so I took the photos out but we during whilst we were building Stereocopy during lockdown we were also busy at Babylon Sturing because I did the spice house for them um so we are, we do have a, a close connection, but oh, oh, um, okay. Uh, yes, I just looked at at their website, and some of the aerial shots looked very similar to what you presented in your drone shots. Yeah. The, okay, so I the spice house that I did is uh, just showcasing the spices around the world, um, particularly uh, the East Indian route um, in the olden days, but. Um, Babylon Sturen is, is very different in the sense that it is very more, it's much more sterile. So it's planted in blocks of plants completely for people to come and harvest. Um, and that's the public also. So it is blocks of things. There's very little interplanting or, um, you know, biodiversity is very scarce, except for the botanical piece um, where, what's his name? Uh, we Aaron's van Jarsveld, sorry, forgot. Aaron's van Jarsveld is busy. That is fantastic, but that is all local plant. That's cycads and succulents, and he's a master. Right. Of that. He's absolutely wonderful. Um, but the vegetable gardens um, is very sterile in blocks. It's it's very beautiful, but it's not. It's a farm, but there's no other gardens in between. Between. It's um, either farm or you have the succulent or South African collection by hand. And that is the difference. It's a working farm. So everything there is harvested and produced. We, as a farm, our gardens at Sterocopy is a connection between the clients, the guests that are staying there, and plants and the healing process that they are going through. So it's a, they get given a journey through the gardens, not only the gardens, but also with, with certain healers and things that they work with. 
um, as a journey of, of healing, which is a very different um, way of gardening. <laughs> yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, so now uh, the, 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 the million dollar question, Leon, is there any easily accessible for you um, plant list that you might send me that I can send to everybody? Um, not necessarily exhaustive, but perhaps, um, you know, uh, um, your sort of top 10 or, or something like that. I can very I can do that for you. I can do a, I can do a, like a top 30. Okay, fabulous. Well, that, <laughs> that, 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 that's <laughs> extremely generous of you. And, um, you know, our compliments, I've already got a date with Leon in November to go and see this revisit this revisit this magical place and I'm very much looking forward to that I think we've all had an excellent it's a beautiful presentation very very um good at sharing exactly the the place uh that you are working at right now it's a pleasure so, sorry, um, sorry about the electricity um still come to South Africa <laughs> don't think it's always dark <laughs> and then um yeah and i hope i see you guys on instagram or wherever okay all right thank you everybody for joining um we'll be going to portugal next month thank you again leon fantastic Good compliments time. for a beautiful presentation i'll thank send you. that list out as soon as i have it everyone see you next week next month indeed ciao